All right, my name is Cody Jones. I'd like to welcome you again to our non-linearly scheduled program, sometimes referred to as philology, where we take up not necessarily an investigation of language, but more so profound and impassioned ideas respecting the nature of man as they resonate in the mind of Phil Rubenstein. Now, Phil here is as his gray hairs can attest, a long, long time collaborator of Lyndon LaRouche. And he currently is manning the front as a general of our Western Front in this fight against oligarchism and a defense of the nation state. As well as, to his credit, is he was a catalyst and a driving force in the creation of what became known as the LaRouche Youth Movement. Joining Phil is Sky Shields, who is, along with myself and others, a co-conspirator in a movement to revive the classical tradition of science and epistemology as part of Lyndon LaRouche's basement team. Now we'll start with turning to Sky to have him perhaps discuss the latest flank in our mission in the basement and put that into context perhaps of some comments that Lyndon LaRouche had earlier today. Is it... Uh sort of a couple of things. I think most people are familiar with what we've been doing so far, the work on the Mars project, that there's been, uh, uh, Mr. LaRouche has been very clear that the only future right now for the human species and also for the, the U.S. economy and the world economy is to put our, our hopes and our focus at a point at least 50 to 100 years in the future of human development, which is where we ought to be by that point is the development of the solar system, the colonization of Mars, the industrial development of the moon, uh, the development of new power sources such as fusion energy, etc. Uh, and that it's only that kind of future orientation that can decide the policy for the present. But what he's wanted us to stress is that it's a difficult thing for a lot of the population as it exists now to conceptualize. And so our job currently in the basement and what will be the job, the focus of a lot of the LaRouche Youth Movement activities in the period to come is to develop the idea of the solar system and the universe as a system, mm -hmm. as a single whole, as, as something which is capable of being acted on and developing and which played, played and plays a role in the development of the biosphere. And so our current project is to create a very clear picture of that as a process. Mm -hmm. And as he said, that also, that notion very much challenges people's current perceived idea of time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that here we're not looking as a time marching on from present to future, but whereas the future is in fact what's acting upon the present mm -hmm. and the past as the, the driver of what our policy should be. Which we're familiar with is your normal human activity, it's a funny thing. Your normal activity is not defined the way people want to define economics. It's not a, each step does not define the success of step. You don't wake up in the morning with absolutely no idea of what you plan to do during the course of the day. You don't, most people don't begin a sentence with no idea of what the, the subsequent word is going to be. Right, right. We're very comfortable with the idea of the future determining the, the present in our day-to-day -day activity. And this is simply making it clear that that really is the, or needs to be the organization of human economy. Right. Perhaps the failures in people's lack of, of <clears throat> willingness to think from the standpoint that it is actually human cognition, which is organizing processes in the universe from the top down. They often want to put it outside the universe. Whereas, as you said, if you just sort of take what some might consider a common sense approach to it, mm -hmm. these concepts of things like the future determining the present, acting on the past, become much more intuitive, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, Phil, you've Yesterday, last night, you gave a presentation ostensibly taking up a theme that Lynn has had a lot of emphasis on lately, which is this idea which comes out of the mouth of Einstein as the finite and unbounded, but which also is very much connected to the ideas we're working on with Vernadsky. It goes back to Riemann, and it's at the core of LaRouche's own thinking on physical economy. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on some of that? Well, I think... Uh, in some ways, the most important thing to look at is that Lynn, in particular, is emphasizing looking at this from the standpoint of human 
economic, human development, human physical economy is the access point to understanding something about the universe that is, uh, that is there, which is the universe in all of its forms is constantly developing. Uh, changing, you know, given what Obama has done to the word change, I don't want to use that <laughs> word, but becoming a certain kind of progress. Uh, there's constant increase in the organization and structure of the universe. There's the development of species, the biological evolution, and all these things viewed from the same standpoint show a greater degree of development. But, and so the question then becomes, how do you understand that? Because the, all the parts of these things seem to be fixed. Now, the, the, the way to really understand this, rather than try to build becoming out of things that are not alive, is look at human history. Look at the human mind. Because in the human mind, you have something that's different. Now, uh, uh, LaRouche brought this up today, but the human mind acts creatively, willfully. We determine, one way I like to look at it is evolve or go extinct. The, and the way we go, we, the way you, the human species operates is that we change our species nature. We change the nature of our activity, the productivity of our labor, and we have greater power over nature based on the discovery of principles. Mm -hmm. Now, that is what defines finite but unbounded. It's, def it's, it's from the standpoint of human discovery. Einstein saw that in Kepler, in Kepler's discovery of gravity as an actual physical principle. That was a principle of development of the solar system, organization of the solar system. So it was a principle, but it also implied an unboundedness, a process of becoming. And of course, that becoming becomes more concrete in the discovery of new principles, later electromagnetic principles. And we begin to discover more about the solar system. And we can control more in nature. And that power gives greater power to labor, mm -hmm. to the productivity of labor, which means new areas of the universe are opened up to us. And then new principles are discovered. So any given set of principles are finite in their reach into the universe. They're finite in the, and they're self-bounded. In other words, those principles are the boundaries of your action. They're, they're, they're the world within which your actions can occur. Mm -hmm. But those actions do open up new areas of the universe and the discovery of new principles. Right. So you find that in human existence, in the actual physical economy, I won't, we, I won't de detail that now, but we use up resources based on a science and technology and that science and technology has to give us access to new resources, a new science and technology. Now, since that's the relationship of the human mind to the physical universe, ironically, what that tells you is that the physical universe has the same character. It has the same character as the human mind. So it's the volitional action of the human mind that gives you an insight into the underlying real ontological nature of the universe. It's bounded by creativity, as Lynn says, per se. Mm -hmm. And now this becomes a way to look at, this is how we actually have to look at science. Because now we're in an era where science is not just the physics of particles, and we can maybe come back to that. But it's a science of a universe that, ha, that, inc that is bounded by creativity expressed in the human mind, in human history, in human culture. Mm -hmm. And so this is a whole... In a sense, what LaRouche is proposing uh, is a whole new development of science. What he said today is physical science is stupid. It's the idea of a mathematical uh, expression that's the limit of our knowledge of kinematic action in a particle space. This is not the, this is not the science of the world today, really, and right. hasn't been since the end of the 19th century. So it's a real, we're, we're, we're situated where we need real breakthroughs in the way we think about ourselves and about science. Well, Mr. LaRouche made the point today, which I think is, is worth taking up, which I, I'd like you to comment on, um, referencing some of what you brought up last night. We said we've reached the point in our human experience, so to speak, where we can no longer depend or rely at all on our sensual experience, that we have to make a distinct break in understanding between what we might ostensibly consider the brain versus the mind. 
that the brain may act as a kind of resonator in a field, but the brain is not the site of cognition or the site of, of real creative mentation. Um, which led me to think about this fight that was going on, as you brought up, between the positivist and people like Planck and Einstein, who seem to have had an understanding of what that fight was. I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. put some context well, the, on that. I think the, the, these are also areas of work and discovery and, and uh, greater depth of uh, effort. And I think we, we, we have a unique standpoint that LaRouche has given it in the science of physical economy of human development, and now we can look at these things. But in the case of Planck and Einstein, there's, there's I really, really think two things to look at. They recognized that they were engaged in a revolution in science, and that indeed whole areas of new problems, which, which were going to require a new approach, were coming up. They were faced with the fact that there was a mathematical expression of this, which... Uh, in some cases, in the case of Einstein, uh, they, they developed coming off of Bernard Riemann. But, it, but, you, but the positivist outlook, which was used to attack Riemann, their idea was to say, look, we can, we can use the formal mathematics. And what we do is we take our experience, our sensory input, and that's all we have, and we can, it, we can take a mathematical form, formalism, and if that can give us something to work with, then that's all there is. We don't mm -hmm. accept the idea of a real world. We don't accept the idea of a mind. It's just the experience and the, for, the axiomatic deductive system. E this is true even of the, the not most radical ones. This is true of David Hilbert or earlier of Weierstrass, uh, uh, earlier than that Laplace uh, and Cauchy. Uh, in the 20th century, you get the really lunatic form of this. Bertrand Russell, Norbert Wiener, and in 20th century science, the idea that there, there is nothing beyond the statistical mathematics, you get this in quantum theory, mm -hmm. beyond the, the, uh, the matrix, that's it, we can't talk about anything, we don't know what's going on, and we can't know what's going on. Therefore, to the positivist, you can never understand a new principle. It may happen accidentally, some of them allow for it, but it's irrational. The only standard of truth is the deductive system based on the experience. Now, Einstein and Planck oppose this. And later you get Vernotsky, who also gives you a real handle, at, from Lin's standpoint, of a new science, really. But what Einstein and Planck understood was that there was no such thing as this kind of positivistic science. It, didn't, it had no reality. Never, a discovery was never made this way. That a discovery always rests on a creative quality of the human mind. Mm -hmm. that there's, and both of them saw this creative quality in a certain sense, more and less clearly, in classical art. Uh, both of them were really, relatively speaking, accomplished musicians. Planck was, uh, at one point, almost became a, a concert pianist. He had to make a choice in his direction, and he chose to go into science. Einstein was always, always considered a you could say, a semi-professional quality amateur, violinist, mm -hmm. although he played other instruments. And, of course, there's the famous case of, I think it was Einstein, Nernst, Planck, and uh, uh, one other, who had weekly quartets, mm -hmm. piano, violin, maybe it was Ehrenfest. Anyway, um, so they saw their, their creativity as really residing in classical art, though I, I don't think they worked uh, out a fully developed idea of this. This was their, let's say, for the one of a better word, it was their instinct. It was their right. insight into their own thinking process. And they knew that the quality of thought they used to make their discoveries was best expressed in classical art, and that that's what was really going on in the science, or that, was, that had to be understood in the science. And then any positivistic mm -hmm. approach uh, failed. And so this 20th century distinction between classical art and classical science is not only idiocy, it's destructive. Right. It destroys creativity in the scientific community. And you end up with this insane formalism, positivism, uh, which, which basically rules out creativity, destroys creativity. And what you're bringing up with Planck and Einstein, their relationship to classical music, very much resonates the same concept that we've continued to emphasize with the juxtaposition of 
sensual interpretation of what's happening in the astronomical with what Kepler did in his Harmonies mm -hmm. of the World, where he's counterposing sort of a visual space understanding of what he's seeing in the, in the cosmos to a musical space, so to speak. And the paradox that comes up in the juxtaposition of those two ways of, of characterizing the phenomena of mm -hmm. the solar system. And you see that then resonating in, for example, Dira Schley, Riemann's teacher, and his work with the Mendelssohns and the music mm -hmm. abends. Then as that comes up later in the relationship to classical art with Einstein and, uh, and Planck. Now, what you have coming out of the work of, of Einstein in particular, also Planck with the, so the paradoxes that come up between uh, what you might consider field, matter, space, time, physical space, time, that's sort of the jump off point for the front end of what we're currently doing in the basement with the, what's been dubbed the, the Cosmic Ray Project, but which obviously encompasses a lot more. Uh, you want to go into some of yeah. what the current project is immediately ahead? I mean, it's funny because it, it plays it's directly off of, I mean, off this last point because it's a trouble in general with the approach to science. I mean, the place, you know, one of the areas in science that's probably the most convoluted right now and is probably the most clearly at a dead end whether or not the people who are involved in it would want to discuss it is, you know, so-called particle physics. It's mm -hmm. sort of people are really trying to push this one little end of smashing things smaller and smaller and trying to figure out what they must do and trying to build up a Hilbert-style axiomatic system of, okay, well, what's the fundamental mm -hmm. one particle that we can build all the rest of these up from? So you get string theory, you get all this discussion of what must it be. Mm -hmm. But what's never addressed is that the whole thing comes from this assumption that there's fundamentally a different set of rules for the way the human mind works and then for the way the the physical universe mm -hmm. works. But the idea is that, okay, well, fine, if you're talking about the human mind, then you have to take all these things into account, emotion, creativity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't, it would be a terrible world if you went about your life without addressing some of those things. So some people try not to. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the, the science, you know, the physics, then you've got to discard all that and you're, you're trying to find this completely, you're, you're trying to find this completely cold, rigorous, logical structure from where you can where you can derive the whole from a uh, a few set initial statements, and if that's your view of the world, if that's your view of the universe, first of all, you start to think that anything in your mind that isn't cold and logical, anything in your mind that doesn't match that kind of theorem lattice structure, must be a liability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anything, because then that's that's the extent to which your mind doesn't match mm -hmm. this idea of this sort of cold lattice right. work of a universe. Uh, when in reality, it's the opposite. The universe itself reflects the exact same kind of creative and developing processes that the mind does. I mean, it's why right now in discussing evolution, the evolution of the biosphere, you're really not allowed to make the simple point that up until now, and, and clearly now, that evolutionary process has had a goal. It's been driving clearly in a, in a direction that you can map mm -hmm. throughout, throughout the, the known fossil record. You've got a clear direction towards uh, uh, you know, more and more complicated species, but really culminating with the one phenomenon in the whole universe which is capable of reflecting on that universe, which is man. If you state that, that was, that's anything besides an accidental unfolding of, of physical laws, you've committed a heresy right now in, in, in modern science. And so the current project is to repair that, is to say, mm -hmm. okay, well, we are going to look at this you, we will look at this entire spectrum of, of matter uh, from the, the, the different energetic phenomena, particle phenomena, to throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, look at gravitational phenomena, uh, really put together a new periodic table, which is inclusive of all the elements of cosmic rays, the alpha particle radiation, beta radiation, uh, but then gamma rays, other electromagnetic uh, uh, radiations, to put together a table of these on the basis of their intended effect. Right. To classify them, uh, where Mendeleev had classified the elements on the basis of their physical properties, on the basis of their observed properties. Well, he says himself, looking for the harmonic relations to them. Uh, we'll do the same, but specifically take this vis-a-vis -vis their action, their role in living 
processes and evolutionary processes and attribute to, to find this intended directed process, this open-ended process of anti-entropic development, to find that where that exists in, in matter and to use that to get some of these, to both get the sciences past their dead ends, the particle physics, et cetera, past the dead ends where they've reached, mm -hmm. but then also to use it as the basis for economic policy making. Right, right. Really start to marry the ideas of Einstein with those of Vernadsky, but of course having to do what has continued to be necessary, reach back to the tradition of people like Riemann, Leibniz, Kepler, as the method which must necessarily guide this process of investigation. Um, I mean, what you brought up, it's about the, the attack has always been against those scientists who have wanted to bring intention into the sciences. I mean, this goes back to the attacks on Fermat, where what he was saying with the, the least action principle of light, or the least time principle of light, the attack was what he was saying seems to imply that light has an intention, that it knows beforehand where it wants to go, what it wants to do. But again, it's the same phenomenon where real science can't include the human mind. But of course, science has always advanced on behalf of those who do include the human mind. As you brought up last night, Phil, uh, the attack on people like Riemann, same thing with Einstein, was the fact that they were too intuitive in their approach. Mm -hmm. That the mathematicians, they didn't see the rigor in the way they came to their conclusions, to the way they worked out their hypotheses. Mm -hmm. But ironically enough, in one biography I saw that while the mathematicians complained about the intuitive nature of Riemann, the physicists thought it was completely lawful. Mm -hmm. They said, hey, this makes complete sense the way he's thinking about this, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the same really gets to the point Lin always makes, which is why in Riemann's habilitation, he said, we've now got to move out of the, mm -hmm. the department of mathematics into the domain of physics. Um, I was wondering if you could touch more as we got to last night, this, the, this role of volition mm -hmm. in the process of, of science. Um, that really, the kind of thing we're embarking on with this one gravity accelerated flight into mm -hmm. the solar system to what we want to do with the colonization of Mars. That's, this really embodies and is proof of the role of volition uniquely in the anti-entropic development of the universe mm -hmm. as opposed to what seems to be lacking, though you can find an anti-entropy in the abiotic and the biotic, you don't find this quality of volition. No, I mean, and I think it's the volition that allows us to understand the real processes of the universe as a whole. Because we decide, human beings create a situation where the science that we have, the principles that we're using, are inadequate. They're inadequate to the continuance of human economic activity. They're also, at the same time, inadequate to our knowledge. So we determine that we're going to do things, create actions in the universe that are going to pose problems and allow us to solve them. So, for example, we peer further into the cosmos, or we find ourselves finding ways to experiment with, and these are all unseen. No one's ever seen an atom, or an electron, or a proton. Uh, we don't really see the far reaches of the cosmos. We see certain effects. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Sense experience now it has almost nothing to do with what we're doing. It's all the experiment or the principles that we're using to set the experiment up. It's, it's more like a, this is why the machine tool process is important, but it's, it's the experiments and what we use, to, the principles that we use to set the experiments up that we're willfully creating questions and answers. And now the human mind has to say, okay, I'm going to look to make these events, these things that we've created, these experiences that we've created, and we've, we've only experienced through the principles that we've created. That's the experimentation. I'm going to now take what I know, take what I've seen, take what I've experienced, take what human history has given me, and see, can I create, discover a principle that effectively not only describes all of this, but gives me a power to go further into nature. 
and to control more of nature, control another part of the electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, what are we doing in the cosmic rays or in fission and fusion? We're finding new areas of radi radiative activity that we can control. Uh, so this means that the volition is part of our, it means that we're, we're acting from the standpoint of creativity in itself. And in doing that, we're testing the creative principles that, or the creative principle that bounds the universe, that bounds everything developing in the universe. And I think this is why Vernatsky becomes so important. Because mm -hmm. Vernatsky says, look, we can define different levels of, of types or qualities of action, the non-living, the living, and the consequences of the, cre the cognitive processes. And we can now look at the way in which those exist together and the transformations and the changes that occur when different parts of the universe are part of the, the living or part of the cognitive. Mm -hmm. Now we're, and, and here we're developing a whole different view of phys or physical space-time or space-time matter, all from a relativistic standpoint, so that there is no such thing as time in a, as a metronomic measurement or as a, a, a rhythmic measurement. Time is the footprint of the kinds of actions that are available to us. Right. And so we can, con time contracts in real terms. We experience this mainly in human, the development of human civilization. Whole parts of the globe that couldn't be part of one another, all of a sudden, they are part of one another. And indeed, the way in which we live has changed. We live longer, we can do more, our activity is denser, our relationships to other human beings. And I think this is, um, all this then leads you to this point that the human mind is different than any physical part of our existence. Yes, you can say the, the human physiology might be an interesting thing because it houses the mind, or the mind is somehow associated with it. But the mind is something totally different. The mind is capable of resonating or bringing itself into attunement with the creative principles of the universe. And that's something that has nothing to do with sense perception. It's, it's only the universal principle, the principles that are reflected everywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. So this is, without, I, I think, without this idea of volition, which brings us into a different relationship to the universe. Because in some sense, human beings, though finite themselves, are very finite, time-wise, size-wise, you name it, uh, nonetheless have a closer relationship to the universe as a whole than anything else in the universe, based on that creative principle. And this may be the key to resolving the unresolved problem of Einstein, which was to find a unified field concept where, in fact, the field which may unify all of these perhaps is the field of cognition, the field of the mind, right. as opposed to any kind of energetic type of right. field phenomena we might want to investigate. The mind, and also the mind in its social representation, because the mind lives beyond the physical body. The ideas that the mind has created of the individual, the principles discovered, has an effect on all future existence, beyond the physical existence of the, of the individual, and in a sense has a relationship to the past. It's built on the past, but it also allows us to view the past from a more advanced standpoint. And I think one of the things that, that uh, Lynn has stressed is that you only know things as you produce the ideas. You know them as the process of the production of the ideas. Mm -hmm. What we know and how we know is the same thing. What exists and how we know the nature of what exists, the epistemology and the ontology are the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're equivalent, even though there's much to discover in all of it. And uh, so th this, this is uh, the, the way human beings exist. And because it's the finite and the unbounded, one way to look at it, as you were discussing it earlier, it's the future. We live really for the future. And we are a unique species in the universe. Mankind has power over the universe. In a sense, the universe is there for mankind. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I always think of a funny irony because people talk about the Copernican Revolution and the Darwinian, and so man is less and less the center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you see, ironically enough, the more we discover, those were the greatest, th those weren't really discovered, but the more we discover, the more we are at the center of the universe. Right. In the sense of Kuza, the center of the universe is everywhere as the universe develops its unbounded nature. Mm -hmm. And you, the, the creative powers of the human mind are really at the center of the universe. So the, the smaller we may seem physically, the less in that sense, central, the more, because we're, mm -hmm. this comes out of our discovering more and more about the universe. Therefore, we're really learning we are more and more masters of the universe. Yeah, and Riemann's way of thinking, you might say that the process is actually bound by the singularities internal to it. Mm -hmm. that you, one might think, well, the mind, human beings are inside the universe and therefore could not necessarily be the boundary of it. But Riemann thoroughly developed a, a concept where the internal singularities actually define what the boundary condition of the process is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that provides a useful key into how we need to think about man's role in this universe. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you brought up about the, in effect, the way that the unique quality of human volition is able to, in effect, bend or shape space-time brings us to a concept you've been developing lately, Sky, on, if you look at, for example, the, let's take that we accept the idea that there has been an evolutionary process taking place on Earth, mm -hmm. and that it's one that's due to a relationship between processes on the Earth, the Sun, the solar system as a whole, the galaxy with nebula, etc., the role of cosmic radiation. That's a pretty large phenomenon mm -hmm. that encompasses what you might consider a very large space-time. But now we're saying we want to, in a sense, condense the totality of that to achieve something new. Mm -hmm. In a sense, as you've talked about, leave the womb, so to speak. Right, right. I mean, you've got to, I mean, it's funny, to take off from what you were just describing, I mean, you're describing this idea from Riemann of a, of a, of a singularity defining... A whole curvature. I mean, to give people sort of a simple image, you picture the, say, a pin prick in the sheet of plastic or something. You've got a hole there, you've got a singularity, but then the entire curvature of the process is defined by that singularity. Mm -hmm. and you can really ask yourself, well, where does that little hole end? Is it the hole or is it the thing that makes that, that, makes that overall curvature? Mm -hmm. And that was what Vernadsky's view of, his idea of the biosphere was really that, taking, you know, his view of a single living organism was that it's not a thing. It's not a little discrete hole in the paper. It's an inflection point. Because if you look at what it does, you've got this little, any, any organism taken as, as a one has got, it's, you're, you're hard pressed to find its boundaries. Meaning the point where you can sort of isolate the thing from everything else and have it still be the thing it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And in every case for a living organism, it dies as soon as you isolate it from its surroundings. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the thing, it's got no definite body in the sense that it's constantly consuming, adding to its body, passing things out of the body. What it passes out of the body is more organized than what, than what went into the body. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you can view the thing really as sort of a singularity in a process of just flow through the organism. Bernadzi called it the, that the biogenic migration of atoms. But if you look at the whole biosphere in that sense, you realize that that's what's happening. You've got a steady flow of this once abiotic matter through living material and then back out into a more organized form, in the form of fossil material, but in something that's much more highly organized than it was prior. Mm -hmm. You get the concentration of metals, you get the concentration of materials that, that weren't in that form prior to life acting on them. The development of most ore deposits, uh, uh, likely the petroleum deposits that we've got inside the earth, uh, everything that we consider to be a dense form of, of, of energy a more organized form of matter is something that's passed through life at some point. Mm -hmm. And you start to get the idea of the biosphere as, this, as really, you almost say an infinitely thin layer. It's, it's, it's nothing but the singularity in this whole continuous process, but how big is that process? If you look at it, what's it, the, the, the origin of all the energy that passes through that biosphere is, uh, in first approximation, it's all all solar energy. This is all coming through photos, via photosynthesis from the sun 
into plant life, into the form of carbohydrates, other uh, high energy structures. And those are the things that become the, the material, the building, constructing material for all the rest of the organisms on the, uh, on mm -hmm. the planet. And you're seeing this structure build and you see, so now if you, you know, you can almost take the earth as your pinprick and then you've got all this flow coming from the sun, coming from beyond. Uh, our current project, as you were just pointing out, Phil, is discussing the, the flow of the cosmic rays. You're looking at the exact same thing. You're looking at the flow, of the flux of all sorts of material into the biosphere, contributing in the organization, the development of it, this sort of evolutionary change. Uh, which is expressing itself, yeah, the speeding up of time, this quicker rate of development, the increasing density of materials, uh, you know, until it reaches an upper limit, at which point we take over with a, a willful version of this. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, it was, it was, you had a passive evolutionary development. Right. With the appearance of man on the scene, you've got something where now man is, sort of, is consciously deciding to drive this thing, to develop this thing, to push it to, to denser and denser, Right, denser and denser structures, higher and higher concentrations of uh, of energy, more organization. You've got you've got a willful anti entropic development, but it's not of just the surface of the earth. It's that entire process, that entire whatever that that complicated structure we've got out there, which isn't it's not an empty space out there. You've got something that's you've got a a quite filled, quite intricate set of electromagnetic. Uh, relations, particle flow, uh, things that are affecting us from light years away, mm -hmm. supernovae, hypernovae, uh, things that are coming from, uh, Mr. LaRouche puts a particular emphasis on the Crab Nebula, that all these things are part of the development of the biosphere. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we start to look at those and act on those, yeah, we're bringing those into the, what Vernazzi called the noosphere. Right. Suddenly those are being brought into the, under the auspices of, of, human economy, human economics, you know, we're, we're figuring out how do you use, you take a look at that structure there, this whole structure of what is sometimes referred to as interplanetary space, but you might want to call it something else or interplanetary plenum, but you look at that and then you figure out how to start to sculpt that in ways that have never, it's never been sculpted before. Uh, and what you've mentioned, one of the ones you mentioned is the, uh, that the point that you've got human constantly accelerated travel through the, the solar system. You've got human beings taking a trips from Earth to Mars at one Earth gravity to make sure that you can keep human beings alive and intact. At that point, you've got the first time you've ever had a, an object moving under constant acceleration under its own volition right? without the, the being under the influence of a gravitational field. And as a result, you get the first artificially constructed gravitational field you 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 get the first artificial curvature of of space time on a solar system scale that's ever existed in the solar system right and you've suddenly got mankind sculpting space time and you do you suddenly take that these phenomena that were once on massive massive scales you know you required you required whole suns you required whole supernovae in order to create these things suddenly you've got them being done by this you know, by the human species as a whole, by the noosphere, by human economy, but then as you're saying, by the human individual. All of this is encapsulated by single mm -hmm. individual minds. Right. You've got the same... <clears throat> you think about the fact that, as we've discussed, you look at something like the biosphere, which has an upward evolutionary quality to it. But nothing in that biosphere, per se, is itself self-conscious of what it's doing. Mm -hmm. No squirrel is self-consciously thinking about how, what's the next process of evolution going to be, right? The plant is not thinking about what relationship must it develop in order to sustain mammals or something. Mm -hmm. So no single entity within that anti-entropic process is self-consciously aware of what the principle is that's driving it. But now with human beings, each individual is in fact capable of mm -hmm. holding that entire concept which previously had just been a boundary of a whole system, mm -hmm. is now able to hold that single concept in each individual's mind, which now creates sort of a, a field of fields, mm -hmm. so to speak, where now the, the field of cognition is one in which each sort of element of that field is itself a boundary condition. And 
yeah, it puts us in a, in a very unique place in the solar system, in the universe, yeah. to where now we're saying, okay, how do we take our understanding of this whole system, which was necessary to put us in this position, was necessary for a development of a biosphere, of a, a, a sustainable habitat for our uprearing, so to speak, over the, over the ages. And now we have to be able to sort of encompass all that in a relatively small space mm-hmm. in a relatively new type of space time as we want to now take that concept into the into the universe at large to further expand the development of the universe at large right you've got all these things i mean we haven't as a species we've got all these things we haven't had to think about i mean you don't most of what is required to keep you alive as an organism on planet earth you don't have to reflect on it's just sort of there like it's got a womb quality it's got a little bit of a garden of eden quality to it you know you're you're walking around, you get to pluck fruit from trees, there's animals here which are edible. Um, occasionally, things go wrong. Occasionally you get you know, a malfunction, you've got a deadly disease, you end up with some kind of autoimmune disorder. Uh, but here on Earth, you tackle them one at a time. What we're talking about with the extinction of the noosphere into interplanetary space is sort of bring them all on at once. From what we've seen so far, that you get, you know, you to take a short trip on the International Space Station and you get diseases that seem to mimic the ones on Earth, but you get them at once. You get mm-hmm. loss in bone density, you get loss in muscle tone, you get problems with circulation, uh, possibly more as we take extended stays. It's not, that's not some unfortunate consequence of leaving the planet. It's a necessary one. You're, you leave the womb, suddenly you have to figure out how to just as the baby leaving the womb suddenly has to eat, has to over time figure out how to feed itself. No longer you don't longer have the umbilical cord. You have to figure out how to breathe. You no longer you no longer managing to pass the amniotic fluid through your through your uh, mm-hmm. you know into your lungs. Uh, just as you have to do all those part of development is learning how to take all those under more and more an increasing level of conscious control. It's the same thing for the species leaving the planet suddenly. The biosphere, all this development, all this evolutionary development that that has developed up until us and is still ongoing, we have to have mastered and turned into something willful as opposed to the passive process it had been up mm-hmm. until we showed up on the scene. Right, right. Now, a lot of what we're talking about here is these are processes or these are, these are events which we may never see in our lifetime, which hundreds of years away, perhaps. Now, I know, Phil, you're on a daily basis in dialogue with a, a, a much broader portion of the population than, say, we are in the basement on a daily basis. So I'm sure you're confronted often with people say, well, isn't this just wild speculation? Isn't this just the imagination running wild? Look at what we face today. We've got poverty today. We've got war today. We've got a lunatic president today. Is this really a relevant discussion? Mm-hmm. What would you well, say? Well, I think this is this is where you have again. It, it, it's the individual, but you, we locate ourselves in one universal process in the universe, which is one place. There's one set of principles that may be expanding in their discovery, but it's all in one universe. And human history, the truth about human history is that it's always the the reaching into the future. It's the people who are oriented to the future and the problems that need to be resolved coming out of the present that are the ones who guarantee, you can call it survival, or Lynn once called it durable survival. In other words, it's not enough to just survive today if in the course of surviving today, you're not going to make it through the next day and the next day and the next day. Sanity is, well, this is the future that I can see that we need in order to guarantee when we get to that future we're going to be able to survive to see a new horizon. And that's durable survival. So if you're not thinking from the standpoint of what do I have to do today to create a future that's going to allow us to create a future that maybe I can see at least that far, then you're not going to survive. Because the nature of human existence is to effectively use our science and technology, use society and the culture. And you have to realize all of this goes through a culture. So the, the question is, what's the sense of the culture and its relationship to the nature of man? 
How does it see the nature of man? How does it see itself promoting the development of mankind? Now, every language culture has its own history and its own expression. Therefore, you need the nation state to carry this out and relations among sovereign nation states. But there is a common mission for mankind that, that requires the development of these different histories of creative development. You have to find the creativity in each language culture and let people find it. But in doing that, we're saying, okay, what we see in looking at human history is it's only the future orientation. The idea that I live my life in this physical form to be able to use something different, the human mind, in its relationship to human history, to other human cultures, to locate myself in that process. So I'm not just an individual. I'm part of that process. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to personally take responsibility to use my mind to create the possibility of a future and a future of that future. And that's my identity. That's uh, what, what, what Lynn means by the human immortality. That's the human soul. It's real, but it's not a mystical substance. It's that commitment to what we know to be the universal truths about human development, about our relationship to the universe, about the nature of the universe. So it, it, in a sense, you have to say to somebody, you can't limit yourself. You can't live like an animal. Animals live day to day. Squirrels don't create poems. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I, I think it's, uh, there's a whole funny topic that can often mislead people, but there's all these efforts to find out what's the nature of the animal mind. And they're always trying to look for something that's a mind. But animals really don't have a mind. You might begin to see glimmers of things here and there, but they don't have a mind. They don't really communicate scientific principles. They may make a tool, but that, that's not the communication of a scientific principle. They don't have a sense of immortality. They don't try to create paradoxes in their linguistic forms that force the other mind to formulate a, an idea in, in their mind as a totality. This, I was talking to, uh, you know, uh, Bruce who uh, works on this earlier. This is sort of a quantum effect. If we look at human activity, human creativity, human social uh, communication of ideas so that the individual can further those ideas, then you're going to get a handle on the fundamental principles. And that is the way humanity survives. I think the, 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 the important thing is that's durable survival for the human species. The idea of making it through a day of collecting acorns and sticking them in your house <laughs> for the winter, human beings won't survive that way. Generations won't survive. And you do have to think of future generations because that's the unique character of humanity. We live through our minds, not... We take care of everything else so the mind can develop its comprehension, its attunement with the principles that are the development of the universe. And we have to look at all of our science more and more the same way. What, 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 I, what Lynn is proposing is really a new definition of science. I think he, he might use in a, a paper that he's working on now, biophysical chemistry or biogeophysical chemistry, modeled on Vernatsky and these kinds of uh, conceptions of the development of physical space-time. So it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's really a breakthrough more like what we saw with what Kepler did who defined a whole new science. Or later on you can say uh, Gauss and Riemann did something similar. Other people, have, uh, Vernatsky does this in the whole approach to the three relevant domains. Lynn is defining uh, the, the need, is saying, is defining the need for a new conception of science, which incorporates from the top down a universal conception of human willful creation, which is, I think, what's embodied in this finite but un unbounded. Hmm. Okay, so with that, we will bring it to an end. Uh, like the prime numbers or a discovery, we cannot predict when the next installment of this program will occur. But we can assure you that it will occur at some future date. So with that, I'd like to thank Phil Rubenstein, Sky okay. Shields, and Cody, uh, Jones. Cody Jones. We'll see you again.